Good morning. Hello. Good morning. How are you? Oh. Well, you know, we just had the August bank holiday. It's the 30th, as you will see from the timestamp. If the timestamp is accurate, where the hell did he come from? Going the uh, wiggly way today, slightly shorter way. By the way, that's a bit more fun. So, hello, there's a crane over there. What's he up to? Ooh, they're all in here, lab. Sort them out. So I was thinking this morning about how dentistry's changed since I qualified. I had a couple of interviews recently, one on uh, talk radio and one on LBC. And, uh, you know, they, they ask you, you've got like two minutes, and they ask you what the problem, what the problem is with the dental sector and what, what you would suggest to sort it out. And it's like, uh, <laughs> the problem is we have no support from the public or politicians or, or the British Dental Association or the media. And what I would do to sort it out is a shared savings approach, which is impossible to explain in two minutes. But for those of you who are slightly more sort of patient, and I won't, uh, I was gonna change the uh, angle of the camera there, but I'm not because that's gonna cause trouble in post editing, or post as we call it in the trade. So, the problem starts at the top in the Parliament selected, and although dental issues might become important, they never really change the government. So, that's the first thing. So, you have to accept that dentists are sort of an ancillary uh, issue, you know. They're just uh, something to beat the government, the current government with. Then, they delegate the scrutiny of the uh, profession to the Health Select Committee, which uh, basically is, thinks that everything's fine because the Department of Health makes sure that everything is fine in the constituencies of the people, people who are members of the Health Select Committee. And um, so when the Department of Health goes along and says, yeah, uh, you know, we don't know what these dentists are talking about, the Department of Health says, the, the um, Health Select Committee says, yeah, no, we don't know either, so I don't know, you know, let's just publish a report saying, yeah, the Department of Health is doing, doing a reasonable job, but we'll make a few criticisms, make it look like we know what we're doing. Now, uh, which, the, you know, which the Department of Health uh, uh, will, will accept if, they're, if it's what they were going to do anyway and which will, um, and that which they will completely ignore if it's anything that they don't want to do. So, then you get down to the, uh, the point where the, uh, there's, they've got this um, uh, department, I read something in the Sunday Times this weekend that said that, uh, you know, people are, are reluctant to um, make changes because they, uh, it makes them look incompetent and it makes them look like they've made a policy error. And this is the Department of Health in a nutshell. They won't ever make changes, however sensible, because if they've been suggested by someone else, because they think it makes them look incompetent or that they've made policy errors they won't ever admit that they make policy errors. So, and this system of paying debts they've got at the moment is certainly a policy error, but they're persisting with it, okay? So, the problem with um, systems that aren't working the way you think that they should work is that you really don't understand how they work. That's what it boils down to. What you have to do is you have to build up a model of whatever, the world, the dental system, your family, that is um, based on, you know, fits in. Your, your model has to fit everything that's happened in the past. And even then it can't be 
relied upon to predict that everything that's going to happen in the future. It might still have come across a set of circumstances that haven't been tested, and it probably will. Um, and then, therefore, uh, it's going to be 50-50, um, say, whether or not your model is going to correctly predict how things are going to turn out. Now, the more closely you study history, and I would say the more pragmatic you are, you know, instead of just following, instead of having a belief because someone else has told you that that, that belief is a fact, um, the more likely you are to have an accurate model. So what you do, and the way you do it is you look at what happens, not what people say. You know what they say, don't, don't, don't take any notice of what people say, only take notice of what they do. And so what you do is you, you have to <laughs> literally follow that. I mean, very quite literally. Just ignore everything that anyone says that they're going to do or that they hope to do or that it's their aim to do or their mission statement. And just look at exactly how. Hello. Someone slightly missed the hedge there. So you, with, a, with a car like that, you, you sometimes you have to wonder about should you go and see if somebody's still in there bleeding all over the steering wheel, but what can you do? What do you do? You don't do, you don't normally stop. I wonder if I saw something happen, but it looks to me that that happened last night. Anyway, so yeah, so only take any notice of what people do and not what they say that they're going to do or that they've done or what they intend to do. And then you build your model and then you'll, in general you'll find that you'll, um, you'll prosper because not you'll adopt a course of action which is more uh, in line with uh, events both past and future. Uh, and it's the future ones that are the big wins, obviously, you know, if you can predict the price of something's going to go up or down or... Then, uh, you know, your... You safeguard your... Quality of life, don't you? Your very existence. Which is why I've got, you know, I've still got... Six litres of sunflower oil in my kitchen and every, no, and then you can't buy sunflower oil for love nor money. Because it, you know, some somebody who knew what they were talking about said that the war in Ukraine was going to cause a, a a shortage of sunflower oil because that's their major export, and so I just nipped out and bought some before most people. And people are, I wouldn't call them dozy, <laughs> although that is the adjective that springs to mind first. But let's just say that you um, can get quite a decent head start on most people if you are uh, following the news and actuality, you know, uh, uh, what's important anyway. And for me, what's important is um, not so much world events, although things like wars and stuff like that are obviously very relevant, but uh, economics, well, economics, Money, basically. Follow the money. Um, because I think that's what directly affects most people. Like, for example, inflation. Um, there are these two opposing schools. The Keynesian school, which says the government should spend and then destroy money when times are good. But which they do the spend bit, but they never do the destroy the money when times are good bit. They, they just spend they just create less, spend less, but still spend. Um, and the um, the Austrian school, which is all about um, preventing governments from printing money, are literally making it impossible for them to print money so that they can only uh, spend the money that they can get through tax and borrowing from the private sector, not borrowing from the central bank, which is what, how they do it at the moment. So, I think 
years they've been going these roadworks. I don't know what they expected to do. So anyway, so so this is the, your model. You've got to approach it from this direction, right? Okay. So motivation of um, MPs is to uh, you know accumulate resources, which basically is money, power, and pass on their genes, which basically means uh, sleeping with their wives, their mistresses, and their research assistants. The Health Select Committee, all of that plus. Uh, they've got a particular interest in health in their constituency, so they go on the health select committee so they could get a new hospital. Uh, Department of Health, their motivation is to... Hang on, I have to stop talking, it's a junction of death. Oh, there is something coming along. Oh, there's a lorry coming along the other way, but I think I'll get out in front of him. That's our stall right now, in which case I'll toast the size of that. B and Q lorry. Hold the thought they sold that much stuff in a month. Well, perhaps it is a month's supply. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so that's the Health Select Committee. And then you've got the Department of Health. Their um, objective now is getting rather down towards the mundane, which is hanging on to their jobs, um, getting as much money as they can pay, get paid for their jobs. Uh, covering their asses if they make a cock up, um, uh, exercising power so they can be seen to be exercising power, and then um, you know coming up with new schemes, reorganising things. Like we had uh, clinical commissioning groups, and then for a few years now they've abolished all that, so they just keep abolishing everything, so they can always say that. If you've got any complaints, then then they've had a reorganisation since then, and or you know, you know, your your complaints are no longer applicable uh, because they're doing things differently now. You know, they weren't working that day. That's not their signature. It's about that broken window. They don't know anything about it. Um, and then uh, you've got the British Dental Association, which is basically a, a clinical and social organization that uh, was forced to adopt a sort of a quasi trade union role um, but w which isn't a trade union it's a special register body which allows it to which uh, exempts it from trade union legislation which is not any other dental association that was set up wouldn't be exempt but the BDA is it gets preferential treatment it gets money from the Department of Health um, members of the BDA uh, end up chairing Department of Health inquiries. Um, members of the BDA end up getting plum jobs, sinecures in organisations like the Care Quality Commission, uh, another non, you know, Quango, quasi-autonomous non-governmental organisation. Um, and then there their objective really is just to perpetuate the BDA to you know for, for hundreds of years they've done this they've just got to keep the BDA going because it's a sinecure for them it's just a cash cow it's just uh, they uh, market it as the association that dentists should join because it's your trade union whereas in fact they only really uh, do anything to you know to pretend to be a trade union because the uh, General Dental Practitioners Association was set up in the 1950s and promised to be a real trade union that negotiated hard on terms and conditions and so the BDA had to say uh, oh no no we do that we'll do that we'll do that <laughs> so, so the GDPA sort of came into existence as a terms and conditions and negotiated body and uh, but didn't really have any of the social and clinical stuff and um, the BDA uh, was was still a big draw for people who, you know, dentists were, again, you have to be realistic, look at it from their own perspective. They, the average dentist thought to himself, well, uh, you know, I'd rather have access to the BD, BDA because then I can, I've got access to the British Dental Journal, which is where all the jobs are advertised, it's the de facto job market. 
I've got access to all the clinical articles in the BDJ because I'm a young dentist and I'm shit hot clinically and I want to stay that way. And um, I'd like to meet all my colleagues and they have a very active branch and section social structure, which, you know, and, and uh, we're tied in very closely to the vocational trainees. Uh, to the point where, you know, if you're a dental student, you were told by your dean that when you qualify, you should join the BDA. And then you went into vocational training, as you did in the latter years, and then your vocational trainer said, uh, right, ha hands up, any of you haven't joined the BDA, you should do that. And so they dutifully did. And uh, what happened was they arranged for the vocational training National Training Day, where everybody got together, including all the trainers, who were, you know, for the most part BDA members, and um, and the, uh, the vocational training budget was allocated to the BDA conference, uh, which helped the BDA conference become the preeminent dental conference. So, uh, you know, they're very closely tied in, very closely tied in to the Department of Health, so much so that they cannot afford to upset the Department of Health. Now you might think it's not a good idea for your so-called trade union to be so closely tied into the employers that they cannot afford to upset them, but that's the situation that they've got themselves into. Um, I always used to say with the, the BDA representatives, the, they needed to remember two things, to do two things when they had uh, came to London to have a representative board meeting. The first one was to press the uh, a zero their odometer on their on their car so that they knew how many miles that they traveled and secondly put in an expense claim at the end so that they could get the very generous uh, mileage allowance back and then and then other than that they were just required to sit there and say yes for everything. And you know it, it goes even tighter than that. Though the British Dental Association Benevolent Fund it's supposed to be independent and it's supposed to assist dentists equally. However, uh, every time a dentist applies for help from the British Dental Association Benevolent Fund, which isn't, isn't the British Dental Association Benevolent Fund, but the BDA insists, or rather the Benevolent Fund, the Benevolent Fund insists that it keeps the name the BDA Benevolent Fund, even though a lot of uh, non-BDA funding uh, is donated, including my, you know, I've, I've donated to the Benevolent Fund, and I've asked them if they're prepared to stop calling it the BDA Benevolent Fund. But they say no, they won't, you know, they're just not, they're not prepared to do that. Um, I think because, you know, the BDA said, you know, there's no way we're gonna allow that. But if you apply to the if, the, if you apply to the Benevolent Fund, the first thing they do you is ask what BDA branch, what BDA section you belong to. And that's the way they discriminate against non-BDA members. Even though non-BDA members contribute and they don't have a policy of discriminating, but that's how they, it's done, it's done de facto discrimination. So, you know, the, the corruption runs deep and uh, silent, you know, behind the scenes, in the back rooms, the smoke-filled back rooms. And so when it comes to a genuine uh, deterioration in dentist terms and conditions, or genuine deterioration in the terms of service in, you know, the NHS, um, BDA is committed to putting on a bit of a show, but, but will never really do anything about it. And the last time they did do anything about it was, was when uh, they uh, balloted their members for a strike. And that was only because the GDPA members, the GDPA balloted its members for a strike. And the BDA could see that they were going to look bad if they didn't ballot their members for a strike. And so the, um, it was uh, quite funny because the GDPA um, got a positive ballot and advised its members to reduce their reliance on the National Health Service, which was a sensible... Um, advice, and still is. And the BDA also got a positive strike ballot and advised their members to refuse to accept NHS patients, which was far more than the NHS dentists were prepared to do. You know, they weren't prepared to just go home down tours. 
So as a result, the BDA uh, strike ballot recommendation was widely, uh, widely disregarded, and they become a laughing stock because, well, certain areas such as the Isle of Wight were quite solid in there. Although there was still the odd dentist or two in the Isle of Wight who said, "No, God damn it, I'm, if I have to see every NHS patient on the island, I will uh, quite happily." Um, the um, that you know overnight er, certain areas like the Isle of Wight just went private overnight because of the uh, of the uh, terms and conditions issue. But no thanks to the BDA. So there's there's all your actors you know in the play. And the poor old patients are, you know, they all they do is they pay this compulsory tax, which everybody pays, on the basis that everybody's entitled to a minimum level of care. And the minimum level of care is uh, just non-existent now. I think it's because at one point the Department of Health could have said dentist look we, you, if you want an NHS contract then you have to provide us with the name of a dentist who's, who's going to carry out the NHS work and that dentist is not allowed to do any private work um, and then and so they said in the early days uh, it's all or nothing then uh, I think a lot of the dentists would have said alright in that case it's all you know it's all because it's too much of a jump to jump from one skyscraper to another. If you're all NHS, to go all private is, is too much of a gamble. It has to be done gradually. So what happened was <laughs> the Department of Health came up with this scheme whereby they would um, pay the dentists all their NHS money for doing nothing uh, except prescribing antibiotics for a couple of years and then uh, make them pinky swear that they wouldn't do any increased private work, increase their private work. And um, which was, you know, I mean, even in my wildest dreams, if I'd been asked to draw up a private conversion plan, uh, I couldn't have come up with anything better than paying them for a couple of years to do sod all so that they could go private <laughs> with confidence, slowly at their own pace and satisfy themselves of the demand for private treatment and uh, watch, you know, the crescendo of demand for private treatment going up and uh, and then and then ask them all to come back into the NHS and then and then wonder why all these stories are going round about um, thousands of dentists leaving the NHS. So what I haven't really done is covered the difference in the service from the patient's point of view. So um, I'm going home lunchtime, so perhaps I'll tack that on to the end because it shouldn't take too long. Because again, all these things are very, very simple. But um, if you just uh, explain to people the, the bottom line is it's a governance problem. And it's a governance problem that doesn't only apply to dentistry. I mean, you know, it works in Defence Health Select Committee and the... Transport Health Select Committee and the Education, now uh, the, the, rather than the Transport Committee, the Select Committee, the Education Select Committee, etc., etc. And so, I'll, uh, all right, I'll talk to you soon. You have a nice day. Bye. Okay, I'm back in a rare afternoon rant. I'll just do it some pallets. Get my wood off the ground so that it dries out before the winter. I've had to leave work early because uh, Mrs. Angry needs to go to the hospital. And she prefers me to shout at the uh, consultants rather than her. Uh, you can hear some. Uh, oh, they're building a load of houses over there. They've really uh, got, a, got a wiggle on with it as well. Speak of the devil, as Mrs. Angry on the phone, wants to know where I am. That's as usual, I've left everything, I've cut everything so fine, I've cut it to the last possible minute. Anyway, you don't want to know all that. Let's, 
You got your own problems. You got your own partners. You got your own hospital appointments. No. I was going to talk about um, the current situation from the patient's point of view. Because the patients get confused. They can't work out why there's no dentists. They don't know. They're not privy to the sort of detail that I went into with you this morning. They don't know that the about that they're in a three-way boxing match with the BDA and the Department of Health, and that they're the ones that always gets loses out. So they just uh, all they know is that they pay much insurance. The dentistry is supposed to be a service that the NHS provides, uh, and uh, they, they can't get it. And I mean, they're wising up a bit now because um, there are other NHS services which are supposed to be provided, like uh, you know, you know, basic things like operations and doctor's appointments and stuff like that that they can't get either. I'm sorry about the clanging in the back. I've got some jerry cans in the back that I need to fill up with uh, diesel. Well, or uh, actually, basically um, E5 petrol because I've got a. My scooter doesn't take uh, E10, and nor does the uh, lawnmower or anything. So, um, yeah, so they get annoyed and they want to know why they can't find an NHS dentist. And uh, what they get from, they don't really uh, interact with the... Um, they don't really interact with the British Dental Association much. But they do interact with uh, two other uh, actors, which are the Department of Health and, and the media. So um, the Department of Health will, and has always had this policy of saying that everything is fine in the Garden of Eden, or the state of Denmark, or whatever, wherever you want to say. They will say that, you know, there may be some localised difficulties, but and you may have to travel a bit further than you'd like, and you may have to wait a bit longer than you'd like. But, um, you know, you can get an NHS dentist if you want one. And uh, this hasn't been true for several years. Uh, and this was blown out of the water by the recent uh, BBC research where they literally rang every dental surgery in the country and said, are you taking NHS patients? And found that 80% like, of them said no. So, so you know, it was really up to the British Dental Association to do that bit of research, but it ended up getting left to the BBC to do it, which was a shame. But either way, it got done, and so now we know that you know four fifths of the NHS dentists in the in the country are not on the NHS. Now, this is immensely frustrating because, from a patient's point of view. You get these phone calls. Do you do NHS? And we try and we try and help people find out what the problem is, and um, you know, and if we can direct them towards an NHS, if they know how to get an NHS, even in theory, if they know what they're supposed to do to get an NHS dentist, um, or who to complain to if they can't get an NHS dentist, uh, but they just hang up on us because as soon as we start asking questions, they think, oh. This bloke's just trying to talk me into uh, coming to see him privately. Uh, and I don't want to come and see him privately. I just want to ring a hundred dentists on the basis that if 2% of dentists are still on the NHS, which has got to be, surely has to be a low estimate, that uh, and accepting patients, that at least I'll get accepted. And I need to do that as quickly as possible. So that consists of going through the Google list ringing every number, do you do NHS? And if they say no, hang up. Or if they don't immediately say yes, when would you like, you know, like to come in at the end of the week, hang up. Uh, which is, you know, it comes across as extremely rude, but also uh, comes across to me as an extremely desperate measure. People can't, you know, they've got past the point of being civil to each other. At that point, it's a scramble for resources, isn't it? There's competition in supply. And it's everyone uh, is bigger than a neighbour, you know. So, the patients don't know anything about uh, governance problems or uh, inefficiency at the Department of Health, etc. All they know is that uh, they're paying for service that they're supposed to receive, and 
I'm being told by the Department of Health that they should receive, but in fact, uh, in practice, they, they can't receive because there are no providers. So, many of them now are sort of uh, waking up to the fact that the NHS is um, for the desperate. But it has changed the pattern of treatment that we're seeing. Because I have, for example, since I spoke to you, not 10 minutes ago, but in reality, five hours ago for me, I have seen two new patients, both of which have a, had a extensively decayed lower right first molar. Now, lower right first molar comes through when you're six years old and is quite frequently the first tooth to go decayed because a lot of people assume it's a baby tooth. It comes through at a time when the rest of your teeth are baby teeth and your diet is rubbish. You probably haven't seen a dentist. They certainly haven't told your parents to put you on a sugar-free diet, which is what we do. And so you get a lot of decay in first molars. But you tended to get it in the sort of 8, 10, 12-year-olds. And then it becomes a problem because what you have to do is you have to decide very quickly, as in within, you know, at that visit or within six months or so, whether or not you're going to be able to keep that lower molar for another 80 years. Because let's assume someone's going to live to be 80 or 90. That tooth needs to last another 60, 70, 80 years. So, and if it's extensively decayed and the patient's only 10, then the chances are it's not really going to survive, is it? Now, the reason why that's very important is because it's better to take these teeth out quickly rather than wait until the patient's 18 or 25 and then take them out then. But what we're doing now is we're seeing a different pattern of decayed lower molars, which is that they are patients who are coming in in their 30s with decayed senses. Now, what's changed? Okay, I think it's because... Uh, as opposed to the sort of dentistry I did in the 80s and 90s, which was uh, decay-related, denture work, uh, recurrent, a lot of uh, poor quality, we used to see a lot of poor quality repeat restorative work, thanks to the fee-for-item system, which where the patients relied to make a living on, on doing a large amount of repeat restorative poor quality work and they needed it to be poor quality because they needed it to be repeat <laughs> and if a filling lasted two or three years generally the patient was happy they regarded themselves as doomed having doomed teeth uh, and um, you know the, the, the dentists for the most part were uh, you know who were non-UK qualified let's put it that way in those days although they tended to come from places like South Africa and Australia rather than uh, the uh, Eastern Europe non-European qualified of the, of the sort of the latter part of my career um, and used to make a high old living and then and then high off to Australia or South Africa before the dental estimates board could catch up with them. Uh, now as a UK trained and UK resident dentist oh, you didn't have that option open to you. Shan Sheaf, Professor Shan Sheaf, are you listening to this you idiot? You didn't have that option open to you. Um, you, um, you were in the same place every day and you expected to be in the same place every day until you retired. You had no incentive at all to do poor quality work. Uh, what you wanted to do was build up your patients uh, and that you could only do that by word of mouth and you couldn't get much word of mouth recommendation if, if you were painful or your feelings kept falling out. So um, what happened was all this kerfuffle and hoo-ha about how fee for item was a, such a rubbish system was really based around concern about the, um, the moral hazard of the pay-as-you-go system and also coupled with examples, rather egregious examples, I'll, I'll happily admit, that tended to um, emanate from dentists who'd uh, come into the country basically raped the National Health Service and then gone back home out of reach of um, 
of the uh, you know the, the revenue protection team. Well, this uh, unease with feed for item, this uh, moral hazard, which you know where if you did like a do on a lower left four. Uh, then why not do a, an MO on a lower left five? Entirely credible. Patience numb anyway. Doesn't take any longer hardly. And all the evidence is, is destroyed because you've got no x-rays showing uh, that there was or there wasn't a, a filling required in the five. Um, you know, it, it, that led to the system we've got at the moment which is the flat rate system or a capitation system whereby you are paid a flat rate for the the work that you do and then irrespective of the number of fillings well the problem is that at both ends of that scale pay as you go at one end and capitation at the other you've got problems at both ends both have got advantages and disadvantages they've got the opposite advantages and disadvantages to each other Pay as you go is very productive. It uh, conjures up a ton of work. <laughs> you get a load of um, productivity out of it. But on the other hand, it's got the downside of potentially uh, over prescription, which the DEB used to keep under control by uh, monitoring through a ser series of um, regional dental officers or dental reference officers as they became known. Um, that were dentists and that, you know, they could sniff uh, a scammer, a scammer, a, a mile away. <laughs> they used to come to your practice and have a nose around and see what you were doing. They, they could tell if you were on the fiddle. Uh, and they had quite a bit of authority to, uh, you know, to uh, sort things out if they did find that things were wrong. Then you've got at the other end, you've got capitation, which is where uh, you know you, you, you get paid a flat rate to look after a patient, and uh, you're expected to do any treatment necessary within that flat rate. Well, that's got its problems because it, the productivity is terrible. Uh, because why would you work? You're getting the money anyway, and. Uh, Oral health is not so good because you're you're going from un, you're going from over treatment to under treatment. So, well, I don't believe he's going to do that. I don't believe he's going to do that. I don't believe he did that. Uh, but it's very rare. Did you see that car pull down the wrong side, the wrong side of the median to overtake? I mean, you know, if I had blue lights, I'd be chasing him. I tell you that. So anyway, look, before I get home, capitation. Problems with capitation under treatment, especially if a patient's coming, if, if a dentist is coming up to retirement. Let's say he's in the middle of selling his practice. Why should he do any work at all? What are the chances of the dentist who's buying the practice finding out before? And that's why Denplan had to come up with a, a fund to fund dentists who bought Denplan practices or those with a substantial Denplan component who found out that they've been the victims of under-treatment. And that's why um, uh, NHS patients are having trouble getting treatment done because the system is designed to under-treat. The way that you might say, well, why did Demplan choose that capitation if it's so, so blooming terrible and results in under-treatment? And the answer is that Demplan knew, as I've just explained, that most dentists are in the same place all the time and therefore uh, cannot abuse their patients. They also knew and argued quite correctly that if a patient um, needs an occlusal filling and the Demplan dentist decides to undertreat it, it's going to turn into a large occlusal filling uh, or an MO or a DO or an extraction or anything that's going to cost more the dentist more money to sort out and because the dentist is, has respon is responsible for the cost of the treatment on Demplan and all these third-party capitation schemes um, that they wouldn't neglect and undertreat because they were UK trained they were going to stick around and it wasn't in their interest to undertreat their patients unless they were retiring 
in which case the fund sorted it out. And the other argument was that um, the dentist on Den plans sets the capitation fee. He decides how much money he'd be happy with to take on the risk of a patient needing treatment in one of the five categories. And there are five fees according to the five degrees of risk, um, which is only fair to the patients. But the dentist um, sits back there and, he, and he's happy because he knows he's done the figures and providing he patients are correctly categorised, which is sometimes a problem when they're not, oh, and he doesn't do and he only does on the scheme what's covered by the scheme and doesn't start including implants in the scheme, then he's going to be fine. So the contrast with the NHS capitation scheme was that the dentist did not set the capitation fee. They were told what the capitation fee is going to be. And there's a hell of a difference as a dentist between being told that you have to look after a patient of average, uh, let's say, average risk uh, for uh, say 400 pounds a year uh, which you've agreed with Demplan or being told that you've got to take on a, a virtually identical patient for similar risk requiring a similar amount of treatment for um, 80 pounds because that's what the NHS has told you that's all they're prepared to pay you and so let, let me ask you which system is going to have the more under treatment the one where you, you're being paid what you've agreed is reasonable or the one where you're being forced to take on patients and it's, you're, you're merely being told what you can charge and, uh, and you just have to do the best job you can within the funds uh, which uh, you, you know, you're being paid. So this is why the system doesn't work from the patient's point of view. Uh, although, as I say, they, most of this is not transparent to them. They don't know why they can't get treatment <laughs> All they know is that they can't get treatment and that, you know, they have to ring dentists like me when they're in pain and go privately. And, and this is why I'm getting more 30-year-olds with decayed sixes than I am 12-year-olds with decayed sixes at the moment. Uh, very, very strange state of affairs. Anyway, I'm home now. I hope you're well. I'll um, upload this as soon as I can. You have a nice day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.